So it really is my, my pleasure to uh, give this talk, especially here, though I see already met many people in the audience who um, uh, I've known for many years and, and talked to about things like this. Um, and, and so this talk in particular is going to reflect things that I thought about um, from back when I was a grad student, but now I'm, I'm coming back to and looking at uh, maybe through a, a slightly different lens. Um, and sort of my, my partner in this has been uh, Chow Chin, who I think is, is on the call too. So, and maybe you can meet him, him after. Okay. So let me just dive in. Uh, I've been very interested in this space uh, that involves efficient uh, learning and all of these high volume interactive uh, using all these high volume interactive data sources that have uh, really become more ubiquitous uh, as smartphones have become ubiquitous. Okay. And uh, the big change here, if you look at a, a picture like there up at the top in contextual bandits or reinforcement learning, is that the uh, learning problem involves kind of probing the environment. And, the, and maybe learning by a smart or efficient trial and error. And where the actions you take really influence what data you collect. And so in parallel to this explosion of interactive data sources, there's been an explosion of academic literature talking about um, models that are inspired by this. Okay, so here's just a, a small sampling of different kinds of um, applications of the bandit liter in the bandit literature that people uh, write about. And um, there are substantial documented successes in, in industry using some of these algorithms as well. In the meantime, what's inspiring us a little bit is if you take a step back, I, I think it's undoubtedly the case that classical randomized control trials or RCTs are still the standard in, in most areas. And what I mean by RCT is that you um, allocate uh, your measurement effort among the treatment arms uniformly at random across all time. Okay, so you fix the chance of measuring each treatment arm and you allocate just equally at random. All right, so in this work, I wanna pause and kind of actually, I think, Sometimes it's just uh, for institutional reasons that it, it's hard for people to adapt, adopt new technologies. But here I wanna take a step back and take seriously maybe what are some of the concerns underlying the desire to use classical randomized control trials. And in trying to write down a model that captures some of these concerns, we'll come up with a new twist on familiar bandit problems, where performing well in, in special instances of those models require that an algorithm displays resilience to uh, delayed observations and something I'll call non-stationary confounders. Then in the second part of this talk, I'll talk about a new algorithm, which we're calling deconfounded Thompson sampling, a pretty small twist to the way Thompson sampling is usually applied, but maybe an important uh, uh, change. And there, some of the motivation is we don't want to propose a totally new uh, way to solve a very particular model. Instead, by building on a standard way of solving a particular model, we hope that that gives insight into how to treat problems that are maybe beyond the scope of this paper. And the last thing, uh, depending how much time I have, I'll go either briefly through or in depth through some theory. They're displaying two flavors of results. One result is meant to uh, unprovably show that the algorithm does have resilience um, to some of these effects that make a model maybe better suited to a randomized control trial. And on the other end, I wanna look at problems that are more standard in the multi arm bandit literature and show that the algorithm has preserved the efficiency benefits that we would hope for in that case. 
Now, Zoom talks are weird. So uh, if you have questions at any point, please uh, uh, just jump in and, and make this more interactive. Okay. So as kind of a teaser for where we're going, I wanna highlight what, what maybe seems like a core tension in this space. So what a multi-armed bandit algorithm usually is designed to do is to learn by trial and error, but to do so as efficiently as possible. And that efficiency is gained, is, is attained by experimenting adaptively across time. And as you go across time, initial experimentation informs you about which options are the best, and which options are clearly bad, and you kind of zero in on the part of the decision space that's most competitive. Okay. So in these pictures below, uh, I guess arm two is the best, arm one is competitive, and arm three is junk. So what a bandit algorithm does is mostly learns, it learns early on not to pay much attention to arm three. Now, this is kind of a tension with a different goal of being robust against exogenous non-stationary variation that could co-occur with the experiment you're running across time. The challenge with that is if you are changing how you measure things across time, and at the same time, the world is giving you a different pattern of observations across time, by mistake, the times when you play an arm could coincide with uh, times when you're getting high or low rewards or something like that. Now, I want to be thinking about how to uh, balance between these concerns in, um, in a natural way. Any questions here? Does this make sense? All right. So this, this mostly won't be relevant for this talk. But I think when I show you a picture like that, the natural um, reaction I, I would have had is, well, if there's only three arms, why don't you just play all three? I mean, uh, uh, does it really, is it really so bad to just play all three? And for this, I, I wanna mention that uh, if we gave up on adaptivity, it would really be a uh, death to a lot of the literature that, that many other people are, are interested in. Okay, so if you go to a problem like reinforcement learning, their adaptive exploration is the only hope of solving uh, many of the most basic problems, okay? Because the decision space is very, very large, and it's only by quickly figuring out how to experiment that you can gather the right information. Okay. All right, so there is the tension. We want to be able to model these kinds of, this kind of exogenous, uh, non-stationary variation that co-occurs with our experimentation. Um, we want to be adaptive, but still robust. All right. So uh, I guess Ben mentioned that I, I've been working with Spotify. So I'll give you a, not, not an example I've, I've really uh, worked on or had much knowledge about, but just some example that it looks like a prototypical A-B test at Spotify. Dan, Dan, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can ahead. I just interrupt for one second? So you requested questions earlier sure. and paused for questions earlier, and somebody wrote one in the chat. So I'll, I'll just read it to you. How does this relate to the exploration, exploitation trade off for bandits? Yeah, I think it, um, well, okay. Uh, our model is going to look just slightly different than, than that uh, usual bandit model. But um, I think that the efficiency trade-off there is really close to the issue of the exploration exploitation trade-off in bandits. Okay, that um, uh, usually what it, what it things really boil down to if you use something like the UCV algorithm in, in bandits is trying to explore intelligently um, by not wasting much measurement effort on arms that are, are very bad both because measuring bad arms gives you low reward and because measuring really bad arms is uh, informationally useless uh, once you know that they're really bad. Um, 
I think that this issue of non-stationary variation is somehow just a layer on top of the challenge of exploration exploitation. Um, it's just a, a wrinkle that makes that hard to, to really uh, realize sometimes in the real world. I'm sure if that's the right way to think. think about it. Okay. So I'm gonna give you a slightly um, unconventional way of writing down a bandit model. And oh, another question. Oh, okay. And to set the stage for that, um, before we can get into math, I think it's worth looking at kind of just what does a prototypical A-B test look like? Okay. So here's what I'm gonna think of a prototypical A-B test looking like. Uh, we have some part of here, the Spotify app, which is helping people uh, find music and podcasts they want to listen to. And at some point in, in recent years, they rolled out a new feature, which creates these little shortcut icons at the top. A prototypical uh, A-B test compares different rules for um, generating what goes at the top here. So different variations on the UI, different numbers of icons, or different variations on which model to deploy. So a model is like a personalized machine learning algorithm trained to predict some label. That label is kind of uh, not exactly what you care about from a product sense, but it's just a thing that uh, uh, it's one of many different labels that people maybe have tested. And you come up with all these different uh, uh, algorithms and you wanna figure out which one's best. So then what you do is you show a variation. So this gives you many treatment arms. You show a variation to a user. You measure some holistic outcome, like not just which uh, icon they click, but something like how much they use the app that day or what fraction of their streams were from the home page, therefore um, reflecting uh, whether you're making retrieval easy. Now, not always talked about, but alongside this, I mean, so this test does not exist in a vacuum. There's tons of other data that's passively observed. Right? So there's tons of things about the time of day when the user showed up, the day itself, whether there's a promotion running that messes with the top of the screen and changes behavior, um, the device the person is using, their age and gender, uh, maybe something about what they were doing the 10 minutes before, whether they're using voice commands, all sorts of stuff is logged. Okay. Uh, stop talking. Okay, so the first thing I wanna flag from this is that you're testing a, a fairly small intervention on the user experience, changing this from four items to six is not changing behavior all that much. And a much bigger explainer of what user response is gonna be is what that user is like, what else is going on at the same time, whether there's a promo running and so on. So context explain maybe more than arm choices. The second thing I wanna uh, mention is that you don't run the experiment to learn about contexts. You already have all this information logged about who your users are, um, how often you run promos, how often people are using voice and so on. So the experiment is not run to learn this part. And the last bit, which is gonna lead to some cognitive dissonance for, for some of you, and maybe for me at first as well, is the decision that's made from this test is standardized across the whole population. Okay, so we're not gonna pick a different UI on the basis of how you used the app in the last 10 minutes or on the basis of uh, your location or different UI for the morning and the evening. We're gonna pick one UI that runs across time. So this is, you know, if you work on contextual bandits as, as your career, you kind of think that, all right, uh, what we should always do is your default way of viewing the world, if you're me, is that always we should maximize reward 
for the given context, right? And so if you have infinite data, it's almost like decisions decouple across contexts. Whenever I see a context, I pick the best one. Now, if you go back to that A-B test, you realize that that's not what they're doing. They're picking one action, which is implemented over the whole population. And then if you go look around the world, you realize that there's actually a lot of reasons why everything around us is often uh, standardized in the same way. And there's reasons that implicitly um, the decision maker, in this case, uh, Spotify, has uh, wants their decisions to be invariant to certain aspects of the context. Okay. So McDonald's is the same everywhere you go in the US. And that consistency is part of the value proposition. They don't want it to be different in different places and at different times of the day. Now that's a sort of, uh, now similarly extreme, any mass manufactured good is standardized for cost reasons, okay? But then if you look around, you start to realize that there's um, often hidden reasons that this is true elsewhere. Amazon prices the same way for everyone. Okay, there's not personalized prices uh, yet. Okay, and so I, in the paper, we have some discussion of these things. All right. So if that's enough to get, get past the cognitive dissonance, we're gonna have a problem with the following mathematical formulation. It's gonna be an extreme point of standardization where the goal uh, in running the experiment is to learn one uh, treatment arm to employ throughout the population across all future contexts. So with perfect knowledge, what we would do is make this a uh, utilitarian choice which maximizes the average um, uh, treatment effect uh, across the future when um, uh, basically when facing users who follow the distribution of, of users who use the service. Okay. Um, here I'm doing a pretty standard thing, which is uh, restricting to um, maybe the canonical special case where um, mean rewards are a linear function of an unknown parameter vector associated with the arm and a known um, feature vector associated with the current context. All right. In this problem, there's gonna be two ways in which prior knowledge is reflected. So one is that uh, I'm assuming that the population distribution is known. Okay. So this means uh, I know the demographics of the United States. I'm just trying to figure out uh, which vaccine is more effective. I know the demographics of the users who use Spotify. I'm trying to figure out which UI is more effective. The second way in which prior knowledge is reflected is that the experimenter is gonna begin with a prior. Um, telling them, for instance, that uh, uh, in the pricing example, certain groups of people are likely to be much more price sensitive than others. I think maybe know that because you have lots of data prior to the experiment. All right. And then this is the last uh, sort of model slide. Um, I'll separate on the left, the information gathering process and on the right, how you make decisions uh, based on the basis of that information gather. So on the left, we run through time, we observe a context, we choose an arm to measure, and then we get a noisy reward signal of uh, kind of reflecting the performance of that arm in that context plus observation. A slightly a non-standard twist here, is in one of the results, we're gonna allow for um, potentially very severe delay in the time to observe the reward. Okay, it, it turns out we get that kind of for free in our, in our proof techniques. Right. Now, over here, we're, so it, after, you know, if you ran this experiment for capital T periods, you generate um, some collection of data this results in 
a choice of arm to deploy in the population. And we're measuring here what uh, Stefan Wager calls the utilitarian regret. Okay, so the gap uh, in the population and the performance you'd get if you employed the best arm versus what you uh, think is the best choice based on limited information. Okay. We'll formalize the objective in a couple of different ways, depending on the result. But for now, you can imagine a reasonable goal being that you want to minimize the expected value of that delta t term um, over uh, ways of gathering information. So this makes sense. Uh, I'll tell you is something that surprised me is that in, in this formulation, the problem changes really a lot depending on whether you assume the contexts to be IID or non-stationary following some weird pattern. Okay. So we're gonna kind of have two different cases, one in the IID, uh, we're gonna be able to say certain kinds of things and one when they're highly non-stationary. So that is, I think this is where the paper uh, starts to get interesting is what happens if the contexts are non-stationary. So by letting the context be non-stationary, we can model uh, more than um, you might have at first thought. So here's one thing we can model is a latent uh, confounding factors. Okay, so the way to get this is we're gonna take the context to be kind of a, a dummy variable. The context is gonna indicate the time period at which the action was chosen and indicates nothing else. Now, we're gonna take the target distribution of interest to be um, mixing uniformly over the past context. And so really the arm we're interested in, in this case, is whatever was best in hindsight across the experiment. Right. So, and in this case, I'm allowing the average, the mean reward when you pick an arm in a given time period to depend on the time period in which you picked it. So if you could pick any thetas in the world, this could be a completely arbitrary pattern throughout time. And there's a substantial bandit literature on the non-stochastic bandits where an adversary actually picks these. So I find that to be a little extreme to guard against that kind of pattern. But by placing a, a structured prior on theta, we could equip a modeler with the, the flexibility to specify um, maybe based on past data, what kinds of patterns are plausible. So here's an, an example. The plots below that I, I showed you in the teaser are generated by creating a structured prior. It's generated from a model where um, there's an arm specific effect, which is constant across time. And then every arm is shifted up or down based on a common uh, non-stationary pattern. Okay. So in this model, if you played arms at, say you play the red arm at the beginning and the green arm at the end, you really can't make inferences about which one's better because it could just be this uh, non-stationary pattern that's leading to a difference. But if you measure them uh, uh, close together in time, Taking the difference between the rewards that was generated indicates something about which arm is better. Okay. Now, what is close together in time, what is far uh, away in time, that can also be specified uh, by determining how erratic the non stationary pattern through time is through this covariance structure. Let's make some. All right. 
So, uh, uh, in, in all, all work where you're kind of proving theorems, it's useful to have in the back of your mind one example that breaks all your proofs, breaks all the algorithms. It's the hard example. And uh, what I'm about to tell you is, is that for us. It's the, the example that's going to break um, common banded algorithms. And so this is similar to the example I just showed you, but maybe a bit more benign. Okay, so uh, for concreteness, let's imagine that uh, my arms re represent prices for some durable good, like a fridge or a laptop or something like that. Okay, um, I don't want to charge. Uh, I don't want to learn through the experiment to uh, have very cheap fridges, um, very cheap laptops on weekdays, but not on weekends, because people are going to figure that out and only buy on the cheap days. Okay, so there's kind of a, an incentive compatibility constraint that restricts to charging a consistent price across time. All right. So now we're gonna run a week long experiment to try to figure out how high to charge the price. All right, so it's a one week experiment, but uh, we expect that there are day of week effects. So here, theta one I is the average revenue you earn charging price I on Monday. And this is the average revenue you earn charging price I on Sunday. Okay. Now, again, we could have this structured prior covariance. Now I'm assuming there are not only um, day effects, and arm effects, so time shifts and arm shifts, but maybe interaction effects that uh, high prices might be better suited to weekends. And uh, what's extreme about an example like this is the pattern to the context. The context naturally, if you run a one week experiment, look like this, Monday, 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 for the first huge batch of customers, then Tuesday, 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 and finally Sunday, 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 Sunday. Okay. So why is this example hard? Okay, before doing the work, probably I would have known the first one, which is what we're calling distribution shift. It means that if you just ignore day of week effects, and run um, a banded algorithm, you could be uh, what I call confounded in your inferences. You may think that uh, uh, price is the best price to charge, but it's only because you've tried it on particular days um, and you haven't seen the full experience. Now, the second one is gonna be the more subtle one, which is if you are doing proper inference, you are going to have face what we call an information delays. Inherently in this problem, if you try something repeatedly on Monday, you are not going to learn whether it works well on the weekend until you get to the weekend. So somehow it's changing a structure that we usually assume in a banded problem, which is here, even if you repeatedly try something, it's not gonna resolve uncertainty fully. And hopefully I can kind of suggest to you before we get to formal examples of algorithms failing, this is the problem, kind of see maybe intuitively that um, information delays are the enemy of adaptivity. Okay, adapting quickly requires that you're learning quickly and information delays are telling you that you cannot learn until the end. So in the paper, we, we make some of this, this formal. We give uh, counterexamples for common algorithms showing that they uh, quote unquote fail. What fail would mean is that even if you ran that pricing problem for a week, but you saw a hundred million customers during that week. So you totally, you definitely have enough data 
to make a good decision. Nevertheless, these, these algorithms fail to measure certain arms in certain contexts and therefore um, fail to make the right decision at the end with some probability. So what, uh, what are we saying fails? So one is um, arms that just ignore day of week effects can get stuck sampling whatever did well at the beginning um, and never uh, go back and sample something that was maybe slightly suboptimal at the beginning. Now, here's one that's maybe uh, uh, more surprising, at least to me initially, somewhat surprising, is that the proper adaptation of UCB to this problem fits. So what would I, what am I saying is the proper adaptation of UCB? It's that I think, well, what's the expected performance of this arm if I deployed it across the whole week? So in the population. And I give myself a bonus if there's uncertainty in the quality of the arm and therefore that the arm has high upside. Right. So I wanna pick an arm that has high upside, given the information I have about it, on its week-long performance. So what we show in the paper is that due to information delays, uh, the upside just doesn't get corrected. The algorithm keeps thinking that an arm might be great on average throughout the week, even as it keeps playing it because it hasn't seen Sunday yet. It hasn't seen Saturday yet, and it hasn't resolved its uncertainty about that arm. So it, it fails in the sense that it keeps playing one arm. Uncertainty does not resolve. It keeps playing it. Uncertainty does not resolve. And it's doing this at the expense of measuring other options. So it's a lack of diversity in its uh, uh, behavior that is breaking this up. So now what I would have expected, it, it has tended to be the case, I guess many, many people on this call like Ben, Ian and Zhang stuff that have worked with me on these problems where it usually seems like if UCB works, Thompson sampling works. And if Thompson sampling works, then some adaptation of UCB ought to at least get the same kind of bound. So I just showed you that uh, the proper adaptation of UCB breaks. I would have expected the proper adaptation of Thompson sampling to break, but it does not. So what is that adaptation? We are going to, so first as a starting point, let me be a little more clear than I was about the kind of inference that deconfounded UCB is doing. So we're gonna do the same thing here. Okay. So notice that uh, uh, by Bayesian updating, um, especially with a Gaussian prior and Gaussian rewards, we could maintain beliefs about the parameters theta, okay. parameters associated with each arm. Now that is enough to infer something about the performance of each arm in each context. It's kind of overkill for us. What we're really interested in is a particular marginal, which is uh, we were interested in the performance of an arm on average across contexts drawn from the population distribution. So by marginalizing this uh, posterior distribution, looking at this particular marginal here, we get a uh, lower dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution, which is allowing us to track both the expected value and the standard deviation of the population performance of each other. 
So what's going on here is that we're tracking beliefs about the thing we really care about, but the way we update our beliefs implicitly is not confounded because we're accounting for exogenous variation um, and how that impacts rules. So what does the algorithm do? I'd probably like to, to Ben, this is then uh, uh, pretty natural. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna act like, uh, given that, that proper accounting for uncertainty, we're going to change the learning target. So we're going to sample an arm, not according to the probability that it's the best arm in the current context as usual uh, Thompson sampling would do. We're gonna sample an arm according to the probability that it's the best um, treatment arm to deploy in the full population. So this is the, what I'll call the probability matching definition of Thompson sampling. It's an intellectual definition kind of, it, it says that you should sample arms according to the probability they're the best arm under the posterior. Now, the reason for the algorithm is, is popular in practice is that there's also an algorithmic uh, uh, definition, equivalent, mathematically equivalent definition, but uh, uh, one that gives you a way to implement this on a computer. You can implement the above intellectual definition by sampling a parameter from this posterior distribution um, and then picking the arm that's best under the sample. So if you go down to this picture here of a non-stationary variation across time, what that sample is drawn from really is you've seen some observations up to time period 400. You're then projecting forward um, about your uncertain beliefs about where this um, time average, this dashed horizontal line uh, um, really falls. All right. So when I get to the, the end with some, some theory, the, the real subtlety we're gonna have is why would this Thompson sampling analog of what we just uh, showed for UCB uh, work when the UCB one um, fails? And, and uh, sort of the, the key to this is that it's uh, not, optimistic in the face of uncertainty. In some ways, it's really randomized in the face of uncertainty. So there's a second change, which is not gonna be something I dwell on too much. It's really from an, an earlier work. Um, the idea is that when, when you run uh, something like this uh, A-B test, there's actually an end to the experimentation process. So you don't just wanna have low regret within the experiment. You care about um, then implementing a decision across many future periods. So to get the algorithm to explore more upfront, there's a, a trick. Uh, and the trick here is to, to run Thompson sampling until you get two arms out and then flip a coin to, to, to pick the best one. So I think this is a, that's too much to, to learn in one talk. So uh, for this, I'll, I'll probably defer mostly to this. All right. So in the remaining time, I'll tell you about these two results that uh, Chow and I have, have proved uh, about this algorithm. So here's the, the two results. Um, I have them side by side here. And they really are stressing uh, uh, different features of the algorithm's performance. If you were like a, a, a decision theorist or something, this would be very frustrating. What's the goal? Uh, we kind of have many things actually that, that probably we want to see out of this algorithm and different ways of formalizing the results are gonna let us stress test these different things we wanna see out of the algorithm. 
So on the left is a result that is stress testing robustness to um, delay in observing the rewards and to non-stationary contexts. Okay. And so on the left is really a model of how the algorithm performs in extreme worlds, maybe, where you would probably just want to use a randomized control trial and seeing whether that breaks the algorithm. Whereas on the right, we are more like uh, performing uh, an analysis in the world where banded algorithms usually shine, where the world is, where problems are stationary and stress testing whether we get um, optimal asymptotic efficiency um, in that case. So the punchline for the robustness result is that if you give me a super hard instance, you give, the, you give me the day of the week problem or something that breaks UCB, then we're gonna get basically the same guarantee as what you would get if you ran um, non-adaptive uniform sampling. If you go over to the problem in the right and you give me um, an instance where contexts are IID and uh, sample sizes are very large, so the algorithm can explore, figure out which arms are the good arms and which ones are really, really bad, focus effort mostly on the better arms, then we are going to get this kind of uh, sharp asymptotic optimality uh, uh, result. Okay. And the, the last, well, two other things here. Getting the two results in parallel is probably more the achievement than getting either result alone. Okay, because the results, as I started this talk saying, there's this tension between robustness and adaptivity. Right, they kind of tell you to go in, in, in opposite directions in your algorithm design. And so the easiest way to get the result on the left would be to not react to the rewards you see early in the experiment and to keep um, sampling everything uh, uh, equally often so that you measure all arms in all contexts and you gather, you make sure you don't get uh, fooled. The right way to get the result on the right is to be aggressively adaptive. Make sure that you don't gather one more measurement of a bad arm than is needed. So these two results are, are um, stress testing performance in extreme regimes that require very different kinds of people. And the last thing here on these two is uh, noting that they're um, fairly different in their formulation. Okay, so the one on the left conditions on the context. So it's allowing the context sequence to be some fixed arbitrary thing, but it integrates over the prior. So it's a Bayesian result. The one on the right is going to integrate over contexts. So it's not stress testing uh, of particular weird patterns, but it is stress testing how you perform on a given draw of the parameter. So it's a frequent distribution. All right. So I think uh, what I'll, I'll probably do is uh, give you a little more detail on the first result and then um, break for questions. So here's what the, the first result is doing, thing, uh, stress testing the robustness of the algorithm. 
So for this result, our mission is to, in some ways, if you think of the day of the week, the problem with day of week effects as the thing that is breaking alternative algorithms, we're trying to figure out whether we can formalize that something like a deconfounded Thompson sampling handles that problem. So a key quantity that's gonna show up in the, in the regret bound is this thing. It imagines that you only played a particular arm, that you played a particular arm for every single time period. Right? So you got to see the arm in every context. And then we want to ask, how uncertain would you then be at the end of the experiment? So this is a way of measuring the information content of the contexts cumulatively. All right. So it, it, somehow, if this remaining variance is large, it tells you that these contexts, it is hopeless to run an experiment. You could not learn what you need to learn. But if that variance is small, then uh, you could learn at least about one arm by uh, exploring fully. Okay. So now the day of the week problem is hard, not because there's not enough information content in the experiment. It's because of the order in which the context appears. It's because it was Monday, 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 uh, rather than the days being mixed up. All right. So this is our, our result. It says that the um, regret of your decision at the end of the experiment, when the, this is the context sequence, that regret is small if the, uh, well, it depends here on the number of arms and on the information content of the context. And uh, this thing is, is entropy. So it says no bigger than log of K. So roughly what you can think of this bound as being as like, uh, uh, it's being, it's as if you played arms uniformly at random and so your uncertainty about each arm at the end was k times this. All right. So is that a good result? What is this information? What is this v thing? Uh, so it's helpful maybe to replace the, the v that is a, a little opaque um, with well, one in this case. So we're gonna replace it with uh, one over T. And so our, our observation is that if you had something like the day of the week problem, the contexts are informative. It's just the order that's bad. And in general, that, that's a, quite a common um, occurrence. Okay. So when that happens, we get this bound here. The regret at the end of the experiment depends on the number of arms and on the number of measurements you're allowed to take. It kind of matches what you would get in a K-armed bandit problem. And the contexts themselves basically disappear from the problem. Okay. So because you only wanna pick an arm to deploy in the future, the additional complexity of having um, to model contexts in order to do proper inference does not inflate your uh, regret at the end. So that uh, getting getting rid of the dimension of the context here is maybe one of the that took a long time after the first result. All right. And I'll just uh, a flag for kind of the experts in the audience that they, the proof might be 
something you're interested in in this case. So the proof of that does not use the proofs I'm used to, at least. It, uh, instead, we use inverse propensity weights implicitly in the analysis of the posterior. Okay. So e. implicitly what we uh, do is we reduce the analysis of regret to the analysis of um, variance. So we, we say that you're, if you imagine that uh, we reduce the decision-making problem to a problem where at the end of the experiment, an uh, uh, omniscient person tells you what the best arm is and asks you to predict its quality. Then um, we ultimately relate variance to uh, the propensity of measuring an arm and use this fact that Thompson sampling is very likely to measure the best arm. Okay. So anyway, I, no one, unless you dedicate about 20 minutes to it, we usually don't follow proofs in talks, but since uh, many in the audience know proofs in this area well, let's kind of flag that this is a, a different one. Uh, okay. And so I am gonna skip to a uh, related work. Um, I think this, this sort of uh, asymptotic efficiency stuff is um, a second uh, kind of contribution to the paper, but I, I wanna say hello to all my friends in the audience and, and get to chat with them. So uh, uh, I just wanna flag that there, there's a bunch of uh, related work in this area, but, I do think that this is a distinctive approach relative to the ones that I've seen personally. Um, so the, the main, probably the main intellectual similarity to this is work on non-stochastic uh, bandits where the reward sequence can have very adversarial non-stationary patterns to it. The main distinction, I guess, in, in our approach is so, so that kind of work really gives up on certain forms of adaptivity because it's guarding against quite perverse possible patterns to the rewards. So in some ways we're striking a different balance, one that uh, maybe requires stronger modeling assumptions, but that uh, if you believe in those modeling assumptions uh, uh, does not need to be as conservative. Yeah.